Okay, we are beginning a review, an exploration of the first book of the New Testament, the first of four Gospels. I hesitate because we sometimes in our reckoning count Acts as a fifth Gospel, and I realize that's a provincialism we use. We should probably be careful about that. But um, one of the questions is, is the Old Testament complete? They call it the canon, that which is part of the inspired word we call the canon or rule or basis. And uh, is the canon complete? The Old Testament ends with unexplained ceremonies, unachieved purposes, unappeased longings, and unfulfilled prophecies. The unexplained ceremonies being the sacrificial rituals which are specified But we don't fully, until later, understand why. What are they for? The feasts of Israel are historical, and yet they're also prophetic, we discover from both. Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning and so on. They have unachieved purposes. There are covenants that are incomplete. Some are unconditional and still incomplete. It's important to understand that. Most people today don't. And, of course, unappeased longings. Nothing more expressive than the book of Psalms and the so-called wisdom literature, that group of books in the middle. And, of course, unfulfilled prophecies. And the key to all of those is a person. Is a person. Jesus said, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And as we go along, we're going to see all kinds of interesting things. I'll try to dig out stuff that will hopefully encourage you and, and excite you about the Scripture itself. But let's never lose sight of what it's really all about. And that's Jesus Christ. The first thing he did after his resurrection, ministry-wise, was to conduct a seven-mile Bible study on the way to Emmaus. And what did he do on that Bible study? It was an Old Testament Bible study. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Every page of the Old Testament speaks of Jesus Christ. Every page. We're going to have 60 references in the Gospel of Matthew. Only Matthew bothers making references. That doesn't mean there aren't allusions of some kind in the others, but the point is Matthew has 60 allusions. Why? Because he's Jewish. And his gospel is very Jewish. We'll get into that. But the New Testament, of course, opens with five books, just as the Old Testament does. The Old Testament starts with the Torah, five five books, and the same thing with the uh, New Testament. We have four gospels in the book of Acts. And then the bulk of the book is really interpretations, explanations. Your best commentaries consist of 21 epistles, 14 ascribed to Paul. I say it that way because some people have different views about the book of Hebrews. I happen to be among those that believe it was also written by Paul, but that's neither here nor there. We'll call it Pauline in in any case. And then, of course, the climactic book, in many respects, the book of Revelation. And as most of you all know, the answers to most textbooks are in the back, and that's the same thing here, that the answers are all in the back. Okay. We are in the middle of the Gospels. We're going to pick the first one. And uh, let's realize that the Old Testament was compiled over literally several thousand years. The New Testament was compiled within one lifetime. What many Christians don't know, and also many seminaries are confused about, is that those autographs, that is the handwritten originals, were in place while there were eyewitnesses and the apostles were still alive. Many people don't realize that. We'll get into that a little bit. The, origi- the New Testament in those early days consisted of four Gospels. Luke was in two volumes, so there were six. You can think of it as six books. The Pauline Corpus, of course, that, and uh, other epistles that were, as they were written, circulated among the churches and then collected by the churches. And the other thing that circulated with them was a copy of the Old Testament in Greek that was translated into Greek three centuries before that period. And surprisingly, most of the quotations in the New Testament, of the Old Testament, those quotations of the Old that are in the New, are from the Greek translation. And that's handy for us, because the Greek's very precise. Hebrew is very expressive, but it also lends itself to wordplay and some ambiguities in certain places. We had 70 of the experts, three centuries before Christ's ministry, 
translated into Greek. We call that the Septuagint, fancy word for 70. Septuagint translation. Now Luke and Paul especially rely, in fact make allusions to, eyewitnesses that were present when their works were published. That's important to recognize, very important. Now one of the things you want to be sensitive to as we go through the New Testament is things that are omitted. In fact, they're surprisingly omitted. And this is important to understand. For example, one of the biggest events in Christian history was Nero's trying to blame them on the burning of Rome, and, and uh, he inaugurated these vicious persecutions. It's astonishing to realize that with all the comments in the New Testament about that kind of thing, the allusions at the time were persecutions primarily by the Jewish communities. The Roman persecutions are noticeably not uh, absent from the Scripture. In fact, Luke, Volume 1 and Volume 2, Volume 2 being the book of Acts, goes out of its way to make the point that the Romans never bothered them, nor did they bother the Romans. That these uprisings that were all through the empire were caused by the Jewish communities, not by the Christians. That's basically the underlying, underlying argument in both uh, the Gospel and Acts. Many people believe that Luke's Gospel were the trial documents that were legally required for an appeal to Rome, Paul's, Paul's defense. Anyway, that's an omission. The execution of James in 62 AD is a very major event in history. It's alluded to in many places, including Josephus. It's, it's not mentioned in the scripture. What does that say to you? That the New Testament documents are written before these events. This is a very surprising uh, piece of evidence that of early dating. The Jewish revolt against the Romans in 66 AD, the climax in the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Not in the scripture, except predictively. 38 years before it happened, Jesus talked about it. And of course, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Jesus warned them about it so specifically that when there was an opportunity, all the Christians got out of town over to Pella, over on the eastern side of the Jordan. And although over a million people were slaughtered in that siege, no Christians were, according to Eusebius. But something else we want to touch on is a scrap of Matthew's gospel that's gotten a lot of attention among scholars. It's called, it's, uh, Magdalene is one of the uh, colleges of Oxford, and the Magdalene Greek 17th slant P64 is the designation of this segment of Greek text of Matthew's gospel. And um, it appears to be dated before 66. It's three fragments. You see the fragments shown on this slide with uh, both front and back, if you will. They are uh, uh, papyrus, co they're a codex, and they have, uh, that means they're written on front and back, which means it is a codex, not a scroll. Scrolls were the, old, the traditional Old Testament way. That's why we always use the scrolls on our little ideograms here. And to remind you, it's New Testament, I always just use a, what simulates a piece of vellum or something. The point is, codex, that's what we would, like a notebook, it's a book with pages, is what's called a codex. It's much more convenient, much more. They were just coming in during Paul's ministry. And he asked Timothy, he asked Timothy, he reminds Timothy to bring him his notebooks. He had notebooks as we think of it, and uh, so forth. We'll talk more about that. There's some surprising discoveries about Matthew regarding writing, but we'll move on. These things have about 24 lines. They're a segment of Matthew 26, Verses 23 on the one side and 31 on the other. One of the things you want to be aware of is that the text, fragment, uh, fragmentary as it is, is a support of Textus Receptus. It's been very fashionable in recent decades for scholars to poo-poo Textus Receptus in, in favor of the Alexandrian codices. The, the, the Westcott and Hort documents are what really underlie most of the modern translations. But scholars are now beginning to realize that Textus Receptus is is, is uh, emerging as a, a more reliable basis. And this, this account is one of the evidences in that direction. But um, there's some advanced technologists. This, this fragment had been found. It was stored in, in, uh, in, uh, at Oxford. But Carsten Thede got permission to examine it with some advanced technology, a scanning laser microscope, which can d differentiate between 20 micrometers layers of the papyrus, and uh, can they can even measure the height and depth of the ink, as well as the angle of the stylus used by the scribe, and they can 
even infer whether he was right or left-handed because of this technology. But because of this advanced technology, what they did, he uh, compared this with four other manuscripts. And without, I'll take you through the short course on this. And basically, he concluded that this is either an original of Matthew or a first-generation copy. And uh, that means it was written while Matthew and the disciples were still alive, whether it was an original or an early generation copy, do you follow me? That has shattered the views. You often hear people, you'll find many uh, Bible helps argue, well, they, most of these documents generated uh, in the second century, the century after the fact. No, that's not true. Not, not true at all. Now, one of the things that we emphasize in all our studies, and I'm, I know you regulars are probably tired of me saying this, but in case there's newcomers here, I want to highlight a basic foundational premise that underlies our entire ministry. That you have in your laps 66 separate books, we call the Bible, that were penned by 40 different guys, more than 40 different guys, in a period spanning virtually 2,000 years. Get that in your mind and then move on. It has an integrated design. And I don't mean just thematically, concepts and so forth. I'm talking very specifically, and I'll show you some surprising examples. The design anticipates in detail events before they happen, which means they not, not only is it an integrated design, the designer, the originator of that de design, had to be outside the dimensionality of time because he writes history with precision before it happens. And so that's the underlying assumption here. Now, our epistemological approach, epistemology is the study of knowledge, its scope and limits. It's a highly neglected field because most people who get interested in that take it in university, in the philosophy department, and all they do is spend centuries redefining words rather than getting anywhere. Epistemology is how do we know anything? How do we learn? The epistemological approach here is the first step is to establish the integrity of the design. One of the things you have to do as we go through any of these books, not just Matthew, any of these books, is to d gain a respect or an insight into the integrity of the total package, not just the Gospel of Matthew, but the full 66, how they all tie together. Establish the integrity of design. Every number, every place name is there deliberately. And once you discover that, and you, re you realize that the origin, or origin of that design had to come from outside time. So our first step is to establish the integrity of design, and then that design establishes the identity of Christ. Christ was not just a great teacher, a great influence, uh, make your list that the secular world will acknowledge from time to time. No, he's, some, he's far more than that. And once you discover who he is, and he then, of course, validates the rest. That's our epistemolo epistemological approach here, because he then, of course, authenticates the original. If it was one book, you'd say that's circular reasoning, not when it's 66 by 40 different guys over thousands of years. You follow what I'm saying? See the difference? Okay. One of the things, before we jump into the text itself, I want you to acquaint you with some surprising aspects of the text, and that is that it has all identification, also authentication codes, and uh, there is, in your Bible, an automatic security monitor. It watches over every single letter. It never wears out. Rust has been working faithfully for several thousand years. It has the what I would consider the fingerprint signature of the author. And uh, there is a thing called a signature. You and I think of it as a handwriting thing. There's also a, a, another kind of signature. You can, ha you can tell certain stars, you can sell certain transmitters from a receiver by their signature. If you're a radio operator, you can re and you're listening to Morse code, you often can tell who it is that's sending it to you because you know what, they call, what the amateur radio guys call his fist. He has a style, you can sense the style and so forth. That's a signature. Uh, you can have a signature that's like your pen, you can also have a signature like a fingerprint, you can have a signature that might be a retinal scan. There are other ways that are unique to you that can be used for identification. There are aspects of this author that is distinctive enough that they can't be, can't be counterfeited. I'll show you. I want to show you those. It's non-compromisable in its design. Now, there are, how many have noticed there's sevens in the Bible? Anybody doesn't have his hand up, hasn't ever read the Bible, right? Okay. They occur in over 600 passages. 
Some of them are very overt, seven of this and seven of that. Some of them are structural. You have to notice that in, in, a, in a covenant there's seven provisions, but you, they don't leap out at you unless you're looking for them, but you always notice there's seven. And some are even hidden that you really have to know what you're looking for. And I'm going to suggest to you that these underlying heptatic signatures, heptatic is a fancy word for seven, sevenfold signatures. Now I want you to imagine that you have this assignment. You've got a scratch pad in front of you. You don't have to literally do this, but imagine I was going to give you this assignment. I want you to draft up a, a um, family tree. And you can do it from fiction for this exercise. A family tree. Father, son, so forth. Okay? But what I want you to do when you're through do, doing, uh, filling out this assignment and turning it in, when you turn it in, I want the number of words that you've used to be divisible by, se by, divisible by seven exactly. In other words, the number of words you've got, if divided by seven, has no remainder. Seven exactly. You understand what I'm saying? That means, by the way, if you're just doing this randomly, you've got six chances of losing and one of winning. Because for every group of numbers, only one, one group in seven will be, will be even. You follow me? Okay. I want the number of letters you use. If I count them all up, divide by seven, it comes out even. How many feel you could do it so far? You're giving up already? <laughs> how many? How many could do it? With, how many could do it with, if just the words were the criteria? Who would? With English, it's easy. You can fudge a word, and you count them up, and oh, I need an extra word. You can fudge it in, right? But now the letters—that's a little tricky, right? You still could do it, probably, but it takes a little more effort. So you're adding constraints. In a random sense, if I've got two, two, seven constraints, seven each, then I have only one chance in 49 of winning. You follow me? Seven squared. Okay. But I want the number of vowels and the number of consonants also be divisible by seven. Getting a little pinched now, huh? A little tighter? Okay. I'm not through. I want the number of words that begin with a vowel divisible by seven. And then, of course, the other, if everything else is met, then the, 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 the consonants will be follow. Okay. The number of words that occur more than once. Anybody still playing? <laughs> Those that occur in more than one form divisible by seven. Only one form divisible by seven. The number of nouns shall be divisible by seven. Well, that doesn't sound so hard. Only seven words will not be nouns. Whoops. Starting to pinch a little bit. Number of names shall be divisible by seven, and only seven other kinds of nouns be permitted. The number of male names shall be seven. The number of generations... Now, you probably guessed what I've done here. I want you to appreciate, though, how difficult it would be for you to do this by hand. Okay? This, of course, is the genealogy of Jesus Christ as found in the first 11 verses of Matthew. That's not all. These numbers happen to be taken from that group. And by the way, we're not talking about English, which is flexible. We're talking about Greek where every verb has to meet five conditions. Not just past, present, future. That's just one of five different kinds of constraints on each verb in Greek. It's precise. Which makes it very expressive, very, very scientific, but it also makes it very difficult to play games. It's in Greek. Now, this gets, it gets worse. Both Hebrew and Greek, they didn't have numbers we're used to Arabic numbers in our culture. But both Greek and Hebrew used the letters for numbers. Each, letter of the, each of the 22 letters in Hebrew and each of the 24 letters in Greek had a numerical value. This happens to be those. You don't have to memorize them. We're not going to have that kind of thing. But um, that means every word, if you take the letters, the number of the value of those letters, each word has a value, a numerical value. Every sentence has... The uh, first 11 verses have a vocabulary of 72 words. The numerical value of those letters when added up is also a multiple of 7 exactly. It happens to add up to 42,364. But if you divide that by 7, it comes out even. 
that should make you uncomfortable. The likelihood of that happening is very small. If you take the groups of letters, each of those groups, as they're used in the vocabulary, also are exact multiple of seven. Think about the planning that had to go into that. So that the vocabulary using is also starting to be, be uh, constrained. Seven, each one seven, multiply by, multiply by seven. Now, the remainder of chapter one, now what I've told you so far, you may remember from Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, we use it several places just to get a warm-up and this sort of thing. But if you take the rest of chapter one in Matthew, there's 161 words left. They're also a multiple of seven. They have 105 different forms. That's a multiple of seven exactly. The, 77, the rest of the vocabulary, 77 words, that's also a multiple of seven, obviously. Within this chapter, the angel is going to speak. If you take the words of the angel, he has 28 words in his vocabulary. It's a multiple of seven exactly. It has a geometrical value of, uh, uh, that's, divisible, that's a multiple of seven exactly. There are 35 different forms he uses, and that's also a multiple of seven exactly. And the, the uh, geomet geometrical value of those words are also a multiple of seven, okay? Always a multiple of seven. It's more complicated than this. I'm sparing you the fact that the angel speaks in rings, and there's in encircling rings of seven if you analyze the structure, but let's move on. In chapter two, the childhood of Christ, the vocabulary is again 161 uh, different words, multiple of seven, the number of letters in that chapter, this is all in the Greek, of course, it's, uh, multiple of seven exactly, and there's num the different forms are multiple of seven exactly, and the values again, geometrical values, are multiple of seven. That astounds me. It's one thing to play around with the number of words, even the letters, but to get the values to add up. It's analogous to my adding up the ages of everybody in this audience and summing it and coming out to a multiple of seven exactly. How do you engineer that? The likelihood is obviously, you know, rare. So, And by the way, if you take the four different divisions of this chapter, and there's three different speakers between angel, Joseph, and so forth, um, they all have similar package structures, always a multiple of seven. If you have two constraints, it's, it's one chance in 49, of winning, 48 losing, right? If you have three constraints simultaneously operating, it's seven cubed. Four, it's, you have one chance in 2,407 of getting it correct yeah, just by accident, by, you know, by, by randomness. If you have nine rules, and that's what I gave you in the first little bit, that's one chance in 40 million of it coming out by chance. Okay? Would you like to try doing that? If you played my little game, well, you've got, uh, if you work eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, that seems reasonable. Eight hours a day, you know, 40 hours a week, that is. Give you a couple, give you weekends off. 50 weeks a year. That means there's 2,000 man hours per, excuse me, person hours, girls, sorry, um, per year. And, uh, or 120,000 minutes per year. You, to get seven to nine chances, your chance of getting any specific sequence in that would be one chance in 40, but more than 40 million. So at, if you could do, if it takes you 10 minutes per draft, you do one of these and try it and s turn it in. If you can do one every 10 minutes, you can do, knock this off in about 3,362 years. <laughs> Which is a crude way of pointing out that it's not likely to happen except by design. You follow me? Okay. It gets worse, gang. There are examples that we're going to talk about where we're not talking about nine rules. We're going to talk about 34 rules. We, it, it, we, when you get to, especially in the Gospel of Mark, there's a lot of debate about the last 12 verses of Mark. And one of the uh, astonishing discoveries is that it has heptatic structures that comply to over, in fact, over, over 70 um, constraints. We're just taking half of those here. And... Uh, they turn out to be a very big number. For 34 constraints, you're talking about 5 times 10 to the 28th tries. There are about 3 times 10 to the 7th seconds per year. 
Let's assume you could try 400 million per second by using a supercomputer. You program a computer to generate so, uh, uh, these drafts. If you, had, if you got 4 times 10 to the 8 tries per second, it would still take over 4 million computer years. So if you had a, a million supercomputers, uh, uh, you would take about another 4 million years using them. As you, again, just to get, I want you to get the, used to recognize that's what we call design in contrast to randomness. Someone designed this, did it deliberately. And we're obviously studying the discoveries of Dr. Ivan Panin. His books are well distributed. You can get your hands on them if you're interested. He was born in Russia in 1855. Died, uh, he got exiled at an early age, got involved with a plot against the Tsar. So he emigrated to Germany and, and then to the United States. He graduated from Harvard in 1882 and discovered Jesus Christ. Now, every one of us in this room that has discovered Christ is a result of a miracle. But if you got a PhD in mathematics from Harvard, that's even a bigger miracle. Okay? <laughs> but he discovered, after he became a Christian, he discovered what's now known as the heptatic structures that underlie the biblical text. He discovered that in 1890. He committed the next 50 years of his life um, generating over 43,000 pages of discoveries. Very tedious reading. This stuff is tough to go through because it's tedious. Tough work. He didn't have a computer to help me either. He's doing this manually. But his discoveries are astonishing. And that, that's obviously what we're sharing here. And you can check them out. And they do check out, by the way. And he went to the Lord in 1942. And I do suspect that the Lord said, Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, the comprehensive, I want to carry this just a step further. The New Testament consists of 27 books. So there's a word that opens the book, and there's a word that closes the book, right? So if you've got 27 books with a front and end, you have 54 words, right? If you, if you take the total New Testament, the vocabulary of, the, that's the, of all the first and last words put together, there are 28 different words. It's a multiple of seven exactly. Oh, the ones in the Gospels, it's also seven different words, open and close the Gospels. Again, a multiple of seven exactly. If you take the geometrical value of that, it also is a multiple of seven exactly. The shortest word is a single letter. It, has, it happens to have a value of 70. That's <laughs> multiple of seven, obviously. The value of the longest word has a value of 1,512, which happens to be seven times six times six times six. The word is apocalypsis. I think that's kind of interesting. Now, this is the one of all of these that blows me away. But you've got to think it through. The vocabulary of Matthew, as, as, as evidenced by his gospel, if you take all the words there and make a, make a list of the different words, you'll discover that the vocabulary that is unique to Matthew these are words that only, you'll only find in Matthew. You don't find anywhere else in the New Testament. The vocabulary that's unique to Matthew occurs 42 times. That's a multiple of seven exactly. And there are 126 letters represented by this vocabulary that's unique to him. It's a multiple of seven. Now, let's stop and think for a second. The only thing that this vocabulary I'm talking about has in, that's distinctive is that none of the other writers, there's seven other writers, there's eight altogether, seven other writers, don't use those words. If you want to assume this happened accidentally, that's mathematically disputable. If you say, well, no, it was somebody has just been very, very clever here. Great, no problem. How did he do this? There's only two ways. He had to get the other eight, seven guys, all eight guys sat down, and they agreed not to use those 42 words, the other seven. How many think that happened? I don't think so. Or you can use this feature as an argument that Matthew had to have written his last. How else could he organize this? The only way he could make this happen, if it's deliberate, on his part, is to have all the other writings in front of him. How many think that happened? 
But see, you could use this as an argument that Matthew wrote his book last, except the problem is, um, it's either, either he either had prior agreement with everybody or his gospel was written last. The, unique to Matthew. Well, the gospel of Matthew has its characteristics, so does the gospel of Mark. If you take the vocabulary that Mark, or Peter, if you will, have for Mark's gospel, it's a number of words, number of letters, that are a multiple of seven exactly. So that proves that Mark must have written last. Except the same thing's true of Luke. The vocabulary in the Gospel of Luke and Acts put together is unique. The, 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 the vocabulary is unique, is a multiple of seven exactly. So is John. It was, each one of these was written last. Whoops! So is Peter, James, Jude, and Paul. Each one must have been written last. Because each one has a vocabulary that's distinctive to it. That's a multiple of seven exactly. Now what's, what's the, when you start to think about this, you begin to realize there's no way that this could have been cleverly engineered. Because these guys are writing at different times under different circumstances. You follow me? Doesn't compute. Some of these clusters of seven bridge the Old New Testament. The term hallelujah occurs 24 times in the Old Testament, four times in the book of Revelation, or the New Testament. 24 plus 4 is 28, a mobile of 7 exactly. Hosanna, shepherd. There's a whole list of these. I just put some of them on here. That uh, Jehovah Sabaoth is uh, 285 times in the Old Testament, twice in the New Testament. But whatever the numbers are, it's always a multiple of seven. If you take the Old and the New Testament, it's one book. One book. Wow is right. When you, begin to, when you begin to embrace this, when you begin to understand what this is really saying, it gives you an awe and a respect for the Bible that is shared by no other book on the planet Earth. It is supernatural in its origin. Always multiples of seven. Well, we're going to get into a number of things in Matthew that are unique to Matthew besides vocabulary. There are four events in the next chapter, the uh, uh, visit of the Magi, the massacre of Bethlehem, the flight to Egypt, the return to Nazareth. That is only in the book of Matthew. There are ten parables that are unique to Matthew. There are many parables that are common to other, several. But these ten, you'll only find in the Gospel of Matthew. There are two miracles you won't find anywhere else. The two, two blind men that are healed in chapter 20, and the coin in the fish's mouth thing with Peter and all that in chapter 17. There are nine special discourses. They're very extensive in Matthew. Now we'll explain how we know this when we get to chapter 9, but do you know why these discourses are so thorough in the book of Matthew? Because Matthew took shorthand. It's a little item for your weekly Bible study group. How do we know that Matthew took shorthand? He was a customs official. It was required. And we'll explain how we know that in the more background when we get to chapter 9. I won't go through it twice, but he, we, we do have good reason to believe. See, customs, that was a requirement for the job. They didn't have copiers or carbon paper. They be able to write. The, all commercial transactions had to be written. So there was, a, there was a form of shorthand skill. It's alluded to um, in uh, Proverbs 20, uh, 45, verse 1 and elsewhere. Um, and anyway, we'll get into that when the time comes. But anyway, if you take the discourses out of Matthew, it's shorter than any of the other Gospels. The reason it's longer than most of them, it's got all this extensive uh, stuff because he apparently just he, he took it down, which is kind of interesting. And there's a number of events, even in the final week of Christ, there's a number of things that are distinctive or unique to the Gospel of Matthew. And we'll get through that, of course, as we get there. So let's jump in. Chapter 1, good place to start. And of course, where, what better place to start than the birth of Jesus Christ? Matthew chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then he starts his family tree from Abraham. As any Jew would, he starts with Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot uh, uh, Judas and his brethren. And Judas begot Pharaoh and Zara uh, of Pamar. 
and Pharaoh's begot Esterom, and Esterom begot Aram, and he's on, we're on our way. One of the things that you want to understand is the design of the four Gospels. The four Gospels, why do we have four Gospels? Well, we got it in quadraphonic, if you will. We have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The first thing is, Matthew is Jewish. His mission statement is to present Jesus Christ as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King. He's Jewish. He, he's, he's the consummation of the Jewish hope of a Messiah. Mark has a different emphasis. He presents Jesus Christ as God's special suffering servant. Luke is a doctor and a Gentile. He's not that focusing on the Jewish history here. He's interested in the humanity. This is God become man. And so he is the son of man is the astonishing thing to Luke, and he focuses on his humanity. And John is yet different than the first three. His emphasis is Jesus Christ as the son of God. People say, Jesus never said he's the son of God, have never read the Gospel of John, among other things. Now, because these are the primary mission statements, the genealogies in them reflect that. Mark is, is presenting him as a servant, so he's not interested in pedigree. He's not concerned about a pedigree of a servant. So it's the one of the four that has no genealogy. Matthew is presenting him as the Jewish Messiah, so he naturally starts with Abraham and demonstrate that, he's the, that, that, that Jesus is the son of David. That's the main thing for him, if you will. The legal, the legal claim to the throne. Luke's a different kind of guy. He's interested in the fact that he's human. And he starts with Adam. And we'll, ex we'll explore some fascinating differences between those two genealogies. There is a genealogy in John. Most people don't recognize it. The first three verses of John are the genealogy of the pre-existent one. And you can, you can technically call it genealogy, the, the pre-existent one. But let's take a look at these genealogies. Luke go, starts with Adam. And most of you may be familiar with this, but I thought I'd at least remind you again that the, 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 the problem with those first ten names is they're not translated. And uh, in our materials, and in the Genesis commentary, and also in our Learn the Bible 24-hour package and so forth, we go through what, the, what, those word, what, the, what those Hebrew words mean that make up those names. And uh, we discover that there's a hidden message in that genealogy. That uh, Adam, of course, means man. Seth turns out to mean appointed. Enosh is mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalalel means the blessed God. Mahalal El, uh, the blessed God or the praised God. Yared is a verb meaning shall come down. Enoch is a, tech, is a teaching, is a uh, academic term, meaning teaching or commencement. Methuselah comes from two roots. His uh, m uh, Muth, which is his death, occurs 125 times in the Old Testament, and uh, Shalak uh, shall, uh, shall bring. His death shall bring. It's a prophecy that as long as Methuselah, he, that was given to Enoch, who named him, as long as he's alive, this, the judgment of the flood would be withheld. And of course, the year that Methuselah dies is the year the flood comes. And then Lamech means despairing, and Noah means comfort or rest. But when you put these together, let's read it in English. In, in Hebrew, it would be Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. In English, man's pointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching that his death, whose death? God's death. His death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Astonishing, astonishing um, little message tucked away in the first ten names. A lot of implications of this, not the least of which is there's no way you'll ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide a summary of the Christian gospel in a genealogy in the Torah. No way. But let's move on. As we go through the continuing verse from verse 3 on, Aram begat Aminadab, Aminadab begat Nasson, Nasson begat Solomon, Solomon begat Boaz, Boaz as we would say, of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begot Solomon of Hur, that had been the wife of Uriah. I want to call your attention to this part of the genealogy. Salmon begot Boaz, of Rechab. Now, here's one of the places where a woman's name occurs in a genealogy. There's five names in the genealogy. 
women's names. And this, of course, is... And Boaz begot Obed of Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse. There's two women there, Rechab and Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. And by the way, they both are probably Gentile. I say probably because Rechab may be a descendant from Zared, and that's a whole... She was a Moabitess, but she may have had lineage from one of the, two, one of the twins from... According to the Mishnah, this is not from the Bible, but there's, there's some belief of that anyway. And of course, Jesse begot David the king. I want to talk a little bit about Ruth. The end of Ruth, there's a genealogy appended to the book of Ruth. This is in the days of, of the judges. In fact, there's a genealogy tucked away in Genesis 38 that may surprise you. Now, Matthew, Matthew takes his gospel a little differently. He takes it, Abraham to David. Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Perez, Hezron, and so on, right down to David. Now, Luke, of course, fills, and when you get to Luke chapter 3, he doesn't end with Noah. He continues and goes through uh, Shem right on to, uh, through Terah. When, he, when Luke gets to Abraham, obviously, Luke and Matthew are, are identical between Abram and David. Were you with me so far? Okay. Now, and, of course, David's the point, that's this, the whole point that Matthew's making is that it is to prove that the Messiah would be the son of David. But I want you to remember these last four names, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and David, David. And uh, we're going to be looking at that here just briefly. The book of Ruth was written in the days of, in the days of Judges. It's the ultimate love story little four-chapter book that you must read if you're going to understand Revelation chapter 5. It's very venerated, even in secular colleges, as a piece of literature. It's often taught in literature as an elegant love story. But it's also profound at both a personal and also a prophetic level. It's very worth your study. It's one of the most significant books in the Bible for the church. That may shock you, because that, that, the church is not in the Old Testament, they tell us, and yet you'll discover it's very important. Because it among other things, exemplifies the role of what we call the kinsman redeemer, the Goel. And it's a central prerequisite to Revelation 5, of course. But something that's interesting as you get into all of this, you'll discover that in these genealogies, the tenth man is always relevant. Noah, Abraham, and Boaz are each the tenth in the line. Kind of interesting. Um, but there's a very strange prophecy that occurs at the last of the book of Ruth. The plot, uh, 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 Ruth is been redeemed uh, by Boaz, and uh, it's, uh, he's the hero of the peace. By his act of redemption, Naomi has gotten back to the land, and Ruth, a Gentile, is taken as Boaz, uh, to, as, his, as his wife. And uh, now it's interesting, at the celebration scene, the last few verses of the book, they're celebrating the wedding of Boaz and Ruth, Ruth being a Gentile, Boaz being the kinsman redeemer. You get to begin to see how this is modeling something. But there's someone who proposes what sounds like a toast. He said, let thy house be like Perez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this woman, young woman. Now, it sounds elegant, unless you know what it's talking about. If, the, if you, someone said that at your wedding, you'd say, same to you, fella. Because uh, Perez was an illegitimate son that Tamar tricked Judah uh, as if she was a prostitute. He was the father, unknowingly. Um, and it's a very sordid tale, stuck in Genesis between 37 and 39. 34 on, you have Joseph. It's an incredible story of Joseph, and you all know the story of Joseph. It's an incredible story. But right in the middle of this, you've got this chapter stuck in with this sordid tale of Judith, Judah and Tamar, and how she contrives to have a child, and so forth. And the the key to this is that a bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation. From, that's in the Torah. And so if you take a look at Perez's genealogy, the tenth generation after Perez is David. So this little toast is actually a prophecy. It's a prophecy of the messianic line, climacting, climacting of course, in David. And uh, these four names are also encrypted in the book of Genesis, chapter 38. The same chapter that we're talking about. Chapter 38, Judah sinned with Tamar. 
It came to pass at that time, Judah went down from his brethren and turned in at a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in unto her. And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. Ur, Ur, Ur. <laughs> you, you don't want to have a name like that for a lot of reasons. And she conceived again, bare a son, called his name Onan. She conce again conceived and bare a son, called his name Shelah. And he was at Kezeb, where she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. So Ur is out of the picture. So Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, wife and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. That was required. That was an... Not a hard obligation, but it was, it was a, what they call a Leverite marriage. The, the, the brother's obligation was to do that. He didn't have to if he didn't want to, but that was what he was expected to do. And Onan knew that the seed would not be his. It came to pass when he went in to his brother's wife, he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Wherefore, he slew him also. The Lord seemed to be taking these guys out when he was displeased. But there's two Two guys now that are wiped out uh, for, for, uh, to be uh, uh, husbands to Tamar. This is called the Leverite marriage from Levere, the husband's brother is what it comes from. It's codified in the Torah in Deuteronomy 25. It's the, ro the role of uh, the, the, uh, the goal is also in, uh, in, the, uh, um, in the picture to understand the book of Ruth. And the ultimate redemption is thus modeled in, in, that occurs in Revelation chapter 5. But let's move on with the story. Then, then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house. He has a third son that he could give her. But he's just lost two sons. And this thing, you know, the, 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 uh, somehow it isn't working. So he just uh, uh, declines to give Tamar uh, uh, one of the sons. Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah thy son be grown. For he said, lest peradventure he die also, and his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. And in the process of time... The daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted. He went up into his sheep shearers to Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Delamite. So he's on the prowl, okay? And was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear sheep. So she put, on, she put her widow's garments from off her, covered her, her with a veil, which apparently was the style for prostitutes in those days, by the way, and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is, by the way, to Timnath, and for she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. And it's going to turn out that that abuse by J um, Judah is more serious than hers, as you'll see in a minute. It's hard for us to get that picture at first. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot, because she, uh, she had covered her face. He turned unto her by the way and said, Go, I pray thee, and let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. In other words, and she said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? He said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. She said, What wilt thou give me for a pledge till thou send it? This gal wasn't born yesterday. Huh? And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet, thy bracelets, and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it to her, and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. She arose and went away, and laid by her veil from her, and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend Adolamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but found her not. He asked the men of the place, saying, Where's the harlot that was opening by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. He turned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said, There was no harlot in this place. Judah said, Let her, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid from, but, and thou hast not found her. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. <laughs> right. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and bracelets and staff. Can you see the scene? Yeah. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son. And he knew her again no more. In other words, not saying that what she did was all right, But it was essential to continue the messianic line, strangely enough. They didn't know that, but that's what's going to turn out. That's why she's in the genealogy. It came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. It came to pass when she travailed that one put out his hand. 
And the midwife took and bound upon his head a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name is called Therese, which means breach. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. And Zerah sort of disappears from history, but there, there are, are there in the Mishnah, they suspect that it could, it, his descendants may in fact lead to Rahab. That Rahab, while she was a Moabite, or an Amorite, um, may have had lineage from Zerah, but that's incidental. Now, I want to show you something. The reason I got into this was for two reasons, to explain something that has more importance than it sounds like at first. But secondly, in the text of Genesis 38, recognize this is the book of Moses, first book of the Torah. You discover letters that are separated by 49 spaces, 7 squared, that happen to spell Boaz. Okay, no big deal. That could be just a statistical oddity. But then you find another three letters, 49 letter intervals, that spell Ruth. Then you find again three letters separated by 49 letters that spell Obed. And then you find again three letters separated 49 letters apart, Yishe, which we call Jesse. And then you find Another, 40, uh, another three letters, 49 letters apart, that spell David. Now, any one of these you could say, well, that's just statistics. But wait a minute. You now have four names, and the separation is always 49, 7 squared. You with me so far? And they are in chronological order. How did Moses... Let's assume he was clever enough to tuck this in there somehow. How would Moses have known this? We're talking the days of Moses. Afterwards comes Joshua. Then the book of Judges. And it's in the book of Ruth. Then Samuel. Long before David. Interesting. Anyway, Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Now, here's an interesting thing. Who is alluded to here? Bathsheba. But she's not mentioned by name. There's no secret. But it's as if the Holy Spirit is pinning the rose on David. It was David's sin. That doesn't mean she's innocent. Don't misunderstand me. But... Clearly, the ascription here is to, um, it was really David's sin. And you get a hint, a hint of this in the last chapter of the book of Proverbs, which is basically Bathsheba's advice to her son, who recognizes in him some of the same traits that she saw in David. And you'll get a lot more out of Proverbs 31 if you really understand who's doing the speaking there. Solomon begot Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begot Abia, and Abia begot Asa, and Asa begot Josephat, and Josephat begot Joram, except he didn't. There are three guys missing here. And we'll talk about those three guys that are not here um, shortly. Joram begot Uzziah, and Uzziah begot Jotham, and Jotham begot Echaz, and Echaz begot Ezekias, and Ezekias begot Manassas, and Manassas begot Ammon, and Ammon begot Josiah. Now, the three guys that are missing is a guy named Ahaziah, and Joash, and Amaziah. These three guys, since they'd gotten into idolatry, were slaughtered. Ahaziah was slain by Jehu in 2 Kings 9. Joash was slain by a servant on that mission, 2 Kings 12. And Amaziah was slain by the people of Jerusalem, all in cases for their idolatry and leading the nation in idolatry. And what does the Torah say about idolatry? The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord, his jealousy shall smoke against that man. This is from Deuteronomy 29. And all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall what? Blot out his name from under heaven. So the record is in there, is what they did. 
but they're not. They're blotted out of the genealogy. And if you've if you ever look, read Matthew carefully, he says that generations from this guy to that guy are 14 generations. No, there's 17. There's three that don't show up because they've been blotted out. Josiah begot Jeconias and his brethren. It gets, it gets more complicated here. Josiah begot Jeconias and, and his brethren, and about the time that they were carried away to Babylon, after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begot Salathiel, and Salathiel begot Zerubbabel. Jeconiah did not begot in the sense of give birth to Salathiel. You'll understand the complication here that astonishes me why most, most people haven't done their homework. Bear with me, it's important, because you'll find many Bible helps that say, gee, there must be a copyist error. They, they haven't done their homework, it turns out, basically. There is a very key verse you will want to write down. In Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30, the last verse of that chapter. By the time you get to Jeconiah, who's also called Jehoiachin, by the time you get there, things have really gotten bad. The northern kingdom went from bad to worse. It's gone, history. The southern kingdom does a little better here and there, but it also is downhill. By the, and the only reason they don't get wiped out is because of God's commitment to David. But in any case, by the time you get Jeconiah, God is so fed up with Jeconiah, he pronounces a blood curse on him. Jeremiah 22, 30, Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. And every time I go, consider this, I always visualize in the councils of Satan that they must have had a party. Because certainly from their point of view, God shot himself in the foot here. Because God is committed to having a Messiah from the line of David. But now the line of David has a blood curse on the royal line. And as you ponder that, I always visualize God sort of turning to the angels saying, watch this one, okay? And we'll see that we're going to come to that. Je uh, Jeconiah, sometimes Coniah, sometimes called Jehoiachin. Let's talk about the house of David. Matthew, of course, when he gets to David, takes his genealogy down through the first surviving son of Bathsheba by the name of Solomon, down through Rehoboam, right on through these guys, down to Josiah. And then he goes down to Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin, and eventually down to Joseph, who is the legal father, but not the blood father of Jesus Christ. Right? And by the way, Jeremiah 22.30 is your verse if you're ever talking to a serious rabbi. Ask him how you're going to get a Messiah now. There's a blood curse on the royal line. And the only conclusion he can come to if he's intellectually honest is it requires a virgin birth. You have a hammerlock on any competent Old Testament scholar with Jeremiah 22.30. Let's move on. Luke, when he gets to David, he does a strange thing. He doesn't go through Solomon. He goes through another son of David. He had many sons. They're listed in the scripture. Not all of them, but there's plenty of them listed. He comes through Nathan. Not the prophet Nathan, the son named Nathan. And he, you come down through this, and he comes down to Heli, who, who is the father-in-law of, uh, of Joseph. It's Mary's father, and I'll show you that in a minute. But there's more problems here before we're all through. Zerubbabel, we, we, we go through all of these names. Zerubbabel, Abiud, begot Elakim, Elakim, Azor, and Azor begot Sadak, and Sadak begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliud, Eliud begot Eliezer, and Eliezer begot Nathan, and Nathan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. You following that carefully? Okay. One of the things you need to understand if you're serious about on any of this is to understand a very peculiar exception that's noted in the Torah to a guy by the name of Zelophehad. Zelophehad had no sons and only daughters, five daughters. And when Moses is dealing with inheritance, he comes to Moses and says, I've got a problem, I've got five daughters, how can they inherit anything? Because inheritance always goes through the mail. Moses doesn't jump to conclusions. 
he, he prayed about it, he went to the Lord. The Lord said, make an exception. So he does. When you get to the book of Joshua, they get in the land, these daughters come to Joshua and say, when they get ready to, after they conquer this, you know, the seven-year war, and they got rid of all this, they, they divide the land. These daughters come to Joshua and say, look, check, check the record, you'll discover we have an exception. If they marry within the tribe, they're allowed to inherit. Great. There's a footnote most people don't understand. What happened? How did you administer that? The father of the bride adopted the husband as his son. That's the way they handled the inheritance. And that's in the scripture, by the way. The Torah, it's an exception to the rules of inheritance. It was requested of Moses in Numbers 27. It's granted by Joshua, in, in fact, then in Joshua 17. The husband is adopted as the father of a bride. You have to dig to find that out in Ezra 2 and Nehemiah 7 and a number of other places. I think it was C.I. Schofield, not in his Bible, in some other writings. He was the first that I can find that first recognized that the claims of Jesus Christ hang on this exception. This anticipates the lineage of Jesus Christ because it's by, it's by this that Jesus Christ claims, has a claim to the throne of David, both through Joseph and also through the bloodline, but without the blood curse. And by the way, in Luke 3.23, Joseph is the son-in-law of Heli. The word in the Greek is nomizo, which means reckoned as by law. He's a son reckoned as by law. Now this comes up in another place. There's another place that people seem to miss this. Anyway, the virgin birth. Let's, let's, let's make, make a couple of comments about this. It was first hinted at in the Garden of Eden. When God speaks of that the redemption will come by the seed of the woman, that's a contradiction in biology, let alone grammar. The seed of the woman. It was prophesied by Isaiah, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth the son. And, uh, and of course it's required by the blood curse on the royal line. Uh, that was Jeremiah 22, 30. But let's continue here. So, uh, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon to Christ are 14 generations. That sounds pretty good, but it ain't quite clear. Clearly, from Abraham to David are 14, that's not a problem. You can count them. The real problem comes on the other line, because you've got, <laughs> this is the, the whole rendering, if you will, um, from post-David, that is. From Solomon to the, to the captivity was 14 generations. The problem is there's 17 names there. And the, the other one is 14, that's okay. But we have Ahaziah, Joash, Amaziah that were killed because of idolatry. So they are literally blotted out of Matthew's account. You won't find them in Matthew's record. You have to go back to Chronicles and to chase that down. On the other side of the line here, we've got Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin. Now, Jehoiachin, that is Jeconiah, same name, there's a curse. The, blood, the, the, the house of David can't continue from him. It sort of doesn't matter. They're in Babylonian captivity. What happens when they come back from captivity? Well, apparently in the line here is Salafiel and Zerubbabel. Well, these two guys are not blood descendants of Jehoiakim. I assume that Salatiel married a daughter of Jehoiachin, okay, and uh, was adopted by him. He was an adopted son in, a, in a, what I'm suggesting. We do find him in Luke's line, and that causes a lot of confusion because these two genealogies are different. One, it happens that you've got two people linked here because they're not bloodline, they're, they're son-in-law type relationships. You follow me? Once you understand that, when they come back from Babylon, who's in the, how does the line of David continue? Through Salatiel, Zorobel, and so forth. But that line continues in the male line down to Joseph, but that's carrying the, the blood curse. The, the son-in-law line comes down to Mary, and, Jake, and uh, Joseph was Mary's, um, was Heli's son-in-law. You're with me? And anyway, this should help clear up that confusion. But I want you to notice the precision with which God deals with. These, these problems get resolved because of this. The, 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 he's always ahead of them. Let's move on. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. 
when as his mother, Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. You know the story. And while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth the son and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from the sins. So Yeshua in the Hebrew, Jesus is the, the uh, Greco uh, uh, adjustment. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall, con shall be with child, and shall bring forth his son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted as God with us. This is Matthew's style. Again and again and again, he'll actually quote the verse that's being fulfilled from the Old Testament. He's the only one that does it of the four Gospels. Moreover, the Lord is speaking again unto Ahaz, saying, This is a quote from Isaiah 7. And I want to get you get to the context here. Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or the height above. But he has said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. In other words, he, he won't presume to do that. He said, hear me now, O house of David. And that's in the plural, by the way. It's to the house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary man, but will ye, will ye weary my God also? In other words, God is asking him to put him to the task, and he declines. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You all know this from, the, from, from uh, it's often repeated, but I want you to answer the, the word. A lot of people make, uh, there's a lot of confusion about the word Alma in the Hebrew, but the best Jewish translators three centuries before Christ's ministry translated this into Greek with, with the, the Greek term, which is not ambiguous, it is a virgin. We won't, we won't spend time on that. Let's move on. Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord has bidden him, and took, him, took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name Yeshua, or Jesus. The preexistent one. The word tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In Revelation 19, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he both ju doth judge and make war. And his clothes with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This is who we're talking about. Absolutely God and absolutely man in one, in one being. Astonishing. The coming one. Sometimes called the second Adam. A prophet like Moses, a priest like Melchizedek, a champion like Joshua, an offering like Isaac, a king like David, a wise counselor like Solomon, and his beloved, rejected, and exalted son like Joseph, the coming one. That's who we're having to deal with. An integrated sign. We have 66 books by, pen, by 40 different guys over several thousand years in which the design, every detail, even the letters and the structures hidden underneath the text demonstrate premeditation, planning that goes far beyond any lifetime. Why do we accept the Bible? Because of the authentication of Christ through it? Over 300 detailed specifications. The crucifixion was not a tragedy, it was an achievement. It fulfilled hundreds of specific specifications. The, the, the precise time of it was predicted five centuries in advance. Now once you understand who Christ is, he then authenticates the Torah and the various elements, Daniel and the rest. Integrated design that transcends the time dimension. And as I say, we establish the integrity of the design that establishes the identity of Jesus Christ, who then, of course, authenticates the, the beginning. He would be born of a virgin, Isaiah said, and he was, Matthew 1. He would be born in Bethlehem, Micah says, and he was. He was taken out of Egypt, and he was. We'll come to that next chapter. He would heal the sick and make people whole, is what Isaiah said, and he did. Scripture says he would be crucified. In fact, it sounds like it was written first person singular as he hung on the cross, Psalm 22. And he was. He would die for our sins, and he did. And be raised from the dead, and he was. Each one of these things laid out in advance. Now, chapter 2 has the visit of the Magi, the massacre, and there are a lot of surprises in chapter 2, despite how familiar you may, you may think you are with the story. So for next time, read Matthew chapter 2, and be thinking about these questions. Who were the Magi? 
Three guys on camels carrying gifts? No, something far. That may surprise you if you don't know the background. Why was all the city troubled when they arrived? This wasn't just some dignitary to see Herod. This shook up the whole city of Jerusalem when they arrived. Why? And what do we know about Jesus' sojourn in Egypt? They go down to Egypt for a while. Herod does it. Is there any evidence of that? Do we know anything about it? We'll show you some souvenirs. And why did the priests march through the streets of Jerusalem in sackcloth in 7 AD? In 7 AD, it's a matter of record in the Talmud that the priests put on sackcloth, marched around the city because the word of God they believed was broken. What's going on? What's all that about? Check it next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.